Welcome to this episode of Outside Fun, where I'll be harvesting wild leeks, otherwise known as ramps. Once I've gathered enough, I'll be handing them over to my lovely wife, where she'll show you how to make leek soup out of them. Wild leeks are known as a delicacy, and once you've tasted them, you'll know why. Wild leeks can be found all year round, but the best time to harvest them is in the spring, once the snow is melted. That's because leeks are one of the first plants to grow in the spring. As you can see by all the green patches of leeks on the forest floor, this makes them very easy to spot if you're looking in the right place. Another reason why leeks are best in the spring is because they are the most tender and flavorful during this time. Later into the summer, leeks will take on a tougher texture. The flavor of wild leek is a perfect combination of garlic and onions. Leeks like to grow in hardwood forests, better yet, if you can find a stand of maples, you are almost certain to find leeks growing nearby. Here, a small spread of leeks is cozied right up against a maple tree. Leeks are usually quite easy to identify. They have long, smooth green leaves, and they grow in patches. Each leek usually has two leaves that join together into one stem that goes into the ground. The stem of a leek plant is usually purple above ground, and the stem below ground will be white, along with the bulb. Although most of the leeks that I've picked have a purple stem above ground, I have picked leeks that have a completely white stem too. And finally, to confirm that you have the correct plant, all you have to do is break a leaf off and smell it. The whole plant will have a garlicky onion smell. Leaves, stem, and bulb are all edible and can be eaten raw, but I do suggest washing them first. Apart from making leek soup, you can also throw wild leeks into a salad to add some flavor. Or you can dry the leaves on a baking tray in the oven and grind the leaves up into a powder that you can use as a seasoning. Since wild leeks are a delicacy, they have been overpicked in some areas, so I urge you to pick responsibly. Once you've removed a leek plant from the ground, it won't grow back, so always make sure to leave most of the leek plants behind so that the patch can regenerate itself. During my walk, I came across several solitary leek plants, which I left alone to grow. But when I came across patches like this, I went ahead and picked a few, before traveling on to another patch, until I had enough for the leek soup. I have a special knife that I use to remove plants from the ground. All I do is stick the knife into the ground beside the plant and dig around it until the plant is loose enough to be pulled up. When washing the leeks, make sure to remove the brown slimy coating from around the bulb. Now that the leeks are nicely washed, I'm going to let my wife tell you how to make leek soup, which is usually only enjoyed in five-star dining restaurants. The secret to great wild leek soup is to keep the ingredients simple. The wild leeks have a wonderful flavor on their own and you don't want to overpower them with too many other ingredients. For this soup we will need about three large handfuls of wild leeks, two tablespoons of freshly chopped garlic, salt and pepper to taste, about a tablespoon of each, three large white potatoes diced, half of a large white onion diced, a cup and a half of heavy cream, and two cups of chicken broth. The first step is to saute your diced onions and garlic in a large pot with a little bit of olive oil, about two tablespoons. Thank you. 
Add about a teaspoon of salt to sweat your onions. You'll be ready for the next step once your onions have turned a translucent color. Once this happens, add in your broth. Add your potatoes. Cover and let simmer for about 15 minutes. Once the potatoes have softened, add in your chopped leeks. Cover the pot and let simmer for about another 5 minutes to soften the leeks. After about 5 minutes, add in the rest of your salt and pepper, as well as your heavy cream. You will then take the soup off of the heat and blend it with a hand blender. Once the soup is a creamy, smooth consistency, give it a taste test. At this point you might want to add a bit more salt or pepper. And there you have it, delicious wild leek soup right from your own kitchen. One of my all-time favorite wild edibles to eat is morel mushrooms. They are also one of the hardest wild edibles to find, which makes them a true prize of the forest. Most morel hunters will tell you that searching for these mushrooms is part of what makes them so great. Morels can be found mainly in the mid to eastern United States and also along its west coast. They also grow across Europe, although I'm not as familiar with their hotspot locations there. Morels are also located in my home country of Canada. However, there are less of them there. In fact, I searched for two years in Ontario, Canada before I found my first patch of yellow morels, but they were worth the wait. The two main types are black morels and yellow morels. Today's episode will focus on the more common yellow morel. But before I get into how to find and identify a yellow morel, I want to caution you. Although morels are fairly easy to identify, there are a few species of poisonous mushrooms that look similar, such as the false morel, otherwise known as the brain mushroom, and the hooded false morel. The tips that I share in this video will help you properly identify a yellow morel, but it's still important that you research morels on your own as well, from multiple trusted sources. And of course, if you're unsure, leave it alone. With all of that in mind, here's a few tips on how to increase the odds of finding your own patch of yellow morels. Morels only grow in the spring, when the soil is most soft. In my area, morel season is only one week long, but down in the States, morel season can last up to a month. Morels grow fast and will often appear overnight. They also die fast and may only last a few days before rotting back into the ground. After collecting for a few years, I have learned to look for certain indicators in nature that tell me it's time to begin searching for these prized mushrooms. Number one, when the leaves on the trees have almost completely come in. Number two, when the trout lilies have come up but haven't blossomed yet.
Number three, when the trilliums have blossomed. And finally, number four, when the mosquitoes are starting to come out. Of course, these are reliable indicators in my area, but you may notice different signs that point to the beginning of morale season in your area. Morels also need a day or two of rain and humidity. Remember, these are mushrooms we're talking about, and mushrooms love warm and moist environments with rich soil. Morels tend to grow on the edges of hardwood forests, especially near rotting trees. Morels particularly love to grow in stands of elm, ash, aspen, and oak trees. The patch of morels that I've found here grow at the edge of a forest which consists mainly of ash and maple trees. A good place to look is around or underneath rotting logs. Once you've located one morale, there will probably be more in the vicinity, so search the surrounding area slowly and be sure to watch where you step. You wouldn't want to accidentally step on a morale. Morales have a honeycomb design to them. They can also be described as looking brain-like. The cap is longer than it is wide, giving morales a consistent cone shape. In other words, morales aren't irregular in shape. The cap is firmly fixed to the stem, as opposed to other types of mushrooms where the cap flares out from the stem, forming a skirt. If a morale looks rotten or shriveled up like this, it's best to leave it alone. This one is obviously past its expiry date. When picking morales, simply pinch the stem until it breaks loose. Pulling the morales out of the ground will damage the mushroom's delicate root system and is therefore not advised. When you discover and properly identify a patch of morales, go ahead and pick all of them. When picked properly, the fibrous root system of the morales, known as mycelia, will remain healthy and unharmed. This means that the mycelia will be able to produce more morales in the future. The great thing about morales is that once you've found a patch, you will likely be able to find them again in the same approximate area in the following years to come. However, morales are somewhat fickle and are not necessarily guaranteed to reappear in the same place. That's because there are many variables that need to fall perfectly in place in order for a morale to be produced. As you can see, morales are hollow on the inside. It is best to collect morales in a mesh or paper bag. This will allow the mushrooms to breathe. Storing these morels in plastic bags can sometimes cause them to turn a little slimy. Morels don't have a long shelf life and should be eaten either immediately or within a day or two of being picked. Some people will dry out their morels so that they can be stored for longer periods of time. However, I've always cooked and eaten my morels within the same day that I've picked them. As I mentioned earlier, morels are hollow, which makes them a great place for slugs and other little critters to crawl inside. But don't let that throw you off because there's a simple solution to this problem. Before I cook any morale, I place it in a bowl of water for about an hour. This will quickly flush out any slugs or bugs that may be living inside. Sure enough, within a half an hour or so, two slugs had abandoned ship and were sitting on the outside surface of the morale, waiting to be rescued. If anyone cares, the two slugs were relocated to the front lawn, and to the best of my knowledge, have been doing quite well ever since. After evicting the morale's tenants, I slice the mushroom in half, lengthwise. Then I gently wash the inside of the stem with water. Morales need to be cooked before eaten, so my favorite thing to do is fry them up in some butter with a little bit of garlic powder. Morales have a great flavor on their own, and they really don't need anything else added to them. Even without garlic powder, morales taste absolutely incredible. As a general rule, if you like fried mushrooms, then you're going to love fried morels. As you can see, my morel has shrunk a considerable amount in the frying pan. This is normal. After a few minutes of frying each morel half on both sides, they were ready to eat. Two years ago, I collected six morels. Last year, I found only one. And this year, I have found one so far. So with our one morel nicely fried, my wife savored one half, and I savored the other. We're hoping that the next rain shower will cause more to appear within the next few days. But if not, we're happy to have found what we have. Life's like that. Gotta savor what you have.
Welcome to this episode of Outside Fun, where I'm foraging for fiddleheads. In the spring, shortly after the snow has melted away, fiddleheads begin to sprout from the ground. By their appearance, one can see why they are appropriately called fiddleheads. But what you're actually seeing here is an ostrich fern in its early stages. Fiddleheads grow fast, and before you know it, they will have unfurled into a fully mature, three to four foot tall fern. At this stage, the ostrich fern becomes inedible. And so, it is only in their fiddlehead form that they are good to eat. Fiddleheads grow in damp, even swampy soil, or in hardwood forests with rich soil. Although they are very easy to identify because of their unique appearance, there are several different species of fiddleheads, some of which are not edible. And so, the species that I'm looking for today is of the ostrich fern variety. The good news is that it's easy to tell an ostrich fern fiddlehead apart from all the other inedible species. Once you've located a fiddlehead, there are three things you should look for to make sure it's the right kind. Number one, the fiddlehead should have bits of brown papery material on it that can easily be picked off. The second sign you need to look for is that the stem of the fiddlehead is both smooth and free of any hairs. And thirdly, the stem of the fiddlehead should have a deep U-shaped groove. These three signs indicate that you have an ostrich fern fiddlehead, which means it's safe to eat. However, they should not be consumed raw. You'll have to properly cook them first before eating them. Before I continue, I'd like to show you an example of a fiddlehead that's not good to eat. Notice how these are fiddleheads, but they are clearly not of the edible kind. Let me prove it to you by using the three identifiers that I just listed. First of all, these fiddleheads are absent of any brown papery material. Secondly, the stem is not smooth, but is covered in fibers. And thirdly, the stem has no hollow U-shape to it. Instead, it is completely round. This tells us that this is definitely not the plant we want. Okay, let's return to the patch of edible fiddleheads that I discovered. When picking fiddleheads, only gather the ones that are less than 8 inches tall. If the fiddleheads are any taller, they are not good for eating. So when I pick fiddleheads, I usually play it safe and pick ones that are about 5 inches tall or shorter. Fiddleheads will grow in clusters, so when picking them, Make sure to leave at least one or two of them behind, so that the fern plant will remain healthy. After I picked what I needed, I brought them home to cook. I started by thoroughly washing the fiddleheads, making sure to remove all the papery material and any lingering bugs that may be hiding out. Then I tossed them in a pot and boiled them for about 7 minutes. After boiling the fiddleheads, I sautéed them in a frying pan with butter and garlic powder for a few minutes. And now they are ready to enjoy. They have a pleasant flavor that is similar to a mild asparagus, and I love the texture of them.
Hello fellow outsiders. Um, just walking in the bush really quietly today to see what I can see. I don't think you guys can hear it, but um, I can hear a turkey calling um, deeper into the bush that way. Um, so I'm just being really quiet to see if I can get in without being detected. And uh, This is turkey season right now, so I'm probably going to see a few turkeys, and uh, if I'm lucky I might even see some coyotes trying to hunt them, so that would be a real treat. But uh, now is the time of year when um, the yellow birch sap is starting to flow. And the yellow birch sap flows um, right after the maple sap is done flowing. Maple sap flows ideally um, when the day is about 5 degrees above zero and during the day and then during night minus 5. But uh, yellow birch trees, the sap flows best when uh, the temperature is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. And I think that equals to uh, 16 degrees Celsius. But anyways, I'm just going to uh, check some yellow birch trees here and see how the sap is flowing. And if I can, I would like to collect some yellow birch sap. So, here goes nothing. So this is a yellow birch tree and um, it looks pretty scraggly. That's how you can tell it's a yellow birch is because the, um, the bark peels and kind of tatters like this. A white birch, the, the bark is a lot whiter and it peels more in sheets. And with a yellow birch, when the sun hits it just right, there's kind of this golden sheen that comes off of the bark. I don't know if you can see it on the camera here, but it's got a bit of a yellowish, goldish tinge to it. And that's how you know you've got a yellow birch. So I'm just going to take the tip of my knife here, and I'm going to tap it into the tree just a little bit and uh, see if there's any sap flowing. And as you can see, it's flowing pretty good, so I'm going to see if I can start collecting some now. So what I've gotten here is a hardwood branch that I'm going to carve into a bit of a spile that I'm going to use to collect the yellow birch sap into a container. I don't know if you can see it, but um, I've whittled this stick flat with my knife, and in the very center, you can see there's kind of a softer part of the wood here. And so uh, I'm going to make this into a spile that I can use to tap the yellow sap. And uh, so I'm just going to take the tip of my knife and just push out the softer wood from the center, and that'll be a channel. Uh, for the yellow sap to flow in, into the bottle that I have uh, set up for it. Okay, so I've got my spile made up here, and I'm just going to make the initial uh, entry into the bark with my knife, and then I'm going to tap the spile into the hole there, and uh, let it start dripping. Okay, this tree has a good drip, so this will be a good one to put my spile into.
The intrusion that my knife makes into the birch is so minimal that it doesn't injure the tree, not any more than a light scratch would hurt a person. Nowadays, birch sap is being hailed as the new super drink. That's because it's packed with vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, electrolytes, and natural sugars. Birch sap is said to boost the immune system, lower cholesterol, detoxify the body, and it is even thought to have anti-aging properties. The sap also contains the chemical xylitol, a naturally occurring sugar alcohol, which the American Dental Association says helps fight tooth decay. Birch sap is marketed not only as a health drink, but also as a beauty product. In some parts of the world, birch sap is so popular that I've heard it can sell for up to $20 a liter. But nature has it on tap for free. Now this is the second drip that I've set up, so between the two spiles that I have here, I should have something to drink fairly quickly, um, which I'm looking very much forward to. Yellow birch sap and, um, well, also sweet birch or black birch has oil of wintergreen um, right in the sap. So uh, if you chew on the twigs or, or boil the twigs to make some tea, which I've done before in previous episodes, It'll have a, a slight hint of uh, wintergreen flavor to it, which is really pleasant. But uh, anyways, now that the second one is ready to go, then I can leave both of them to drip for a while, and I'll return soon. It's been about two hours now, and uh, yeah, so let's take a look. Okay, so this one's still dripping a little bit, but uh, I've only collected a little bit of sap in there. So I'm just going to take this off the tree now and uh, go on to the next one and see how much I've collected there. So again, I've only uh, had these dripping for two hours and I have almost half a water bottle here and this tree was dripping a little slower obviously so less but um, still a little bit. Notice that this one here is a little more cloudy than the one off the tree that was dripping faster so I don't know if uh, this sap is starting to, the sugars are starting to break down already but I'll try them separately and see if there's a difference in flavor. Something that I forgot to mention earlier was that uh, yellow birch sap flows for only um, two to three weeks, so it's much shorter than the maple sap season because uh, on the maple trees the sap flows for, I think it's around four to six weeks, so uh, a much faster uh, period. So you have to get the, the yellow birch trees when the time is right, and uh, I just so happened to, to get them in the right time.
definitely refreshing. Uh, it has a slight yellow tinge to it, but uh, not much. And uh, it, it's actually quite cold too, which is nice. A lot of people assume that maple sap and yellow birch sap uh, will have a really sweet and sticky kind of flavor to it, uh, but actually um, both saps are, they taste a lot like water uh, because they haven't, been, they haven't been boiled down yet uh, to where the sugar content is higher. So with yellow birch sap, um, you get maybe a hint of wintergreen flavor, but not much. And the same thing with maple sap is you get just a hint of the maple flavor, but it's hard to distinguish. It, it does taste a lot like water, but the fact of the matter is that this stuff is, this stuff is really, really refreshing. And uh, of course, you can't uh, deny all the health benefits that come with drinking this stuff. Um, so all in all, really refreshing, really healthy. And this, my friend, is the taste of spring.